Truman Capote's book, Ink for Blood, is based on a true story of a murder in Holcomb, Kansas. Capote learned about the quadruple murder in a newspaper article, and before the killers were captured, he decided to travel to Kansas and write about the crime. He was accompanied by his childhood friend, a fellow author, Arthur Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, and together they interviewed local residents and investigators assigned to the case and took thousands of pages of notes. In Holcomb, Kansas, in November 14, 1959, the Clutter family was murdered. They were a very respectable family, and the town was hurt, and they were not very good folks. Kurt Clutter was a very widely respectable man who established very successful and very prosperous farms in modest beginnings. Bonnie Clutter, Herb's wife, was the complete opposite of Herb. She was very seclusive and developed many mental illnesses that restricted her from leaving the house. Nancy Clutter was more like her father, Herb. She was very popular and very well-liked. She was a high member of the 4-H club. Kenyon, of age 15, was more like his mother, Bonnie. He was more seclusive and stayed in the basement most of his time, making new things. The night of the murder, Bobby Webb was the last person to leave the house. He was Nancy's boyfriend, and Mr. Clutter did not really approve of their teenage relationship, as we know from Susie Kidwell, who was Nancy's best friend. Nancy was the last person to go to bed last night, and right before she died, she wrote in her diary all about Bobby Rock coming over that night. Herb was the first one to go to bed in that night, that night, since his bedroom was added on the first floor. The murderers came in screaming for asking where his money was, but as we all know, Herb didn't keep money in the house. The only place Herb thought there would be money in the house was Bonnie's bedroom, so the murderers marched him at gunpoint to the room. Bonnie was woken up in hysteria. When they couldn't find money in that room, then they marched into the two children's room, Nancy and Kenyon. Nancy was woken up first, and then Kenyon. Nancy stayed in her room when they marched Kenyon down to the basement. The murderers took Herb and Kenyon down to the basement. They tied Herb first to the ceiling, and then they cut him down. Then they tied Kenyon back to the couch, right near Herb. Each family member was tied up and gagged, except for Nancy. Herb was killed first to a shotgun blast to the head. Kenyon was the next to die, also a shotgun blast to the head. They next decided to kill the two women. Bonnie Clutter in hysteria was shot to the head with her eyes open. Nancy Clutter was the last to die, although she was never gagged, but still shot to the head. They were found by Nancy's best friend, Susie Kidwell, who was going to church with them the next day. She walked into Nancy's room and found her dead. The only evidence that investigators could find was a bloody boot print next to Herb Clutter. This was the only lead that they ever had. A remarkable stage of events, the two murderers were identified, Richard Hickok and Perry Smith. The two men were tried in Garden City Courthouse from March 22nd to March 29th, 1960. They both were sentenced to death on the Kansas State Penitentiary and were not hanged until April 14, 1965. During the whole trial, Truman Capote was there, taking notes for his new book, In Cold Blood. However, Truman Capote never wrote down actual notes. He would just memorize all of it, which leads us to believe that some of it may not have been completely accurate. We notice throughout the novel that Capote focuses on Perry Smith more, as he had more sympathy towards him because of his awful childhood, as he was dead. Capote was also gay, which leads us to believe that he developed more of a crush on Perry. However, he still visited both Hickok and Perry in their jail cells on death row to take notes for his book. He also spent more time with Perry Smith on death row, as he would talk to him more often. Throughout the novel, we see that he portrays Hickok is more of a natural-born killer, and Perry is just a sidekick. This also leads us to believe that maybe not everything he said in the book was completely true. Here is a scene from page 37 in the book. Capote portrays Dick as being the mastermind of the house. Key quotes here are no witnesses and nothing can go wrong, both said by Dick. And in Capote's words, because the plan was Dick's, from first phone call to final silence, However, KBI documents suggest that Al Dewey, the investigator, waited five days before he could follow up on the lead. Capote also portrayed Al Dewey as the prime 
investigator of this case. In reality, he wasn't as given as many leads as he portrays in this case. Many records show that Al Dewey helped with Lily when he first arrived in Kansas. He helped Paul considerably as he gave access to Lance's diary, whose photo Lance was always written and always with whom she was working. There's also a scene at the end of the book that occurs at a cemetery, which never actually happened, which makes us believe that this book was written for entertainment, not so much as factual information. This is a scene located on page 343 between Al Dewey and Susie Kimbo. They are in the cemetery at the Clutter's grave, reminiscing about their life. This scene actually never happened and was made purposely for the book.